Hey guys, and welcome to another Emadio Compositions tutorial. Now this is another first steps in preparation tutorial, and it's uh, episode number 33. And today we're once again going to take a look at uh, material theory, and at the theory uh, of how light interacts with objects and why they appear to us the way they do. Okay, so we're once again going to work with GIMP. And I'm just going to show you a few things. I'm going to explain a few things and you can just watch and relax. So let me open the scene we worked on or just the file we worked on last time. And first thing I want to take a look at is something I already explained, but I didn't make it very clear. This was um, the very starting point where we started out last time, just this black ball. Now, one thing is important. This is not actually black. Um, the reason why I painted it black is because there's no light hitting it, therefore it appears to be black. Now we then um, took a look at what happens if there's a lamp and an light actually perceives things and how those rays are being reflected or absorbed and what happens if the body is emitting light, like this, okay. And then we drew in the specular rays and the diffuse rays and finally we saw what I would give us. Okay, you can see this diffuse pass or the diffuse part, which is this gray, and the very bright white part, which is the specular reflection. Now, what I didn't make quite clear last time is that, as I said, this ball isn't black. It's actually this gray. Okay, the reason why it's black over here is just because no light is hitting it, therefore we cannot see what's happening over there. Now, that's not very realistic. In real life, you always have light everywhere because it scatters so easily and it bounces around like crazy. But in this case, just to simplify things, you can see uh, I did it this way. Now, one thing is important. Uh, although this is gray, the specular highlight is still white. And that uh, applies for most materials, actually. Most plastics and stuff like that have mainly unmodified specular reflections, okay? They just reflect the light the way it comes in. As opposed to the diffuse reflections that are more like uh, they take on the color of the material, okay? Uh, metals make an exception. Most metals, they actually color the specular or the uh, the sharp reflections as well. So if you have like copper, then you have, then it has ob obviously has a orangish copperish color and the specular highlight would have that as well. Now, um, today we're going to take a look at exactly that at first, but with another color. So here we've got a red ball. Okay, a red, or just a red sphere, or whatever that's supposed to be. It doesn't really matter. The thing is, why is it red and when is it red? This, this object appears red to us if white light hits it. Okay, so here I have um, a lamp that is emitting white light. Now, what's important to know is that this doesn't actually emit white light. It just emits um, rays with different wavelength. And if a different wavelength actually hit our eye, then we can see different colors. So you can see this is blue, green, and red. Blue is, has a pretty high frequency. Green has a lower frequency, and red has a very low frequency. So this is at the lower end of our uh, range of the vis visible light, and this is at the uh, upper end of the, of the range. And if green, blue, and red are actually combined, then you can see white light. And in our eye, we actually have three types of sensors, or actually uh, four. We have um, parts that, that only recognize dark and light. And then we have parts that uh, recognize only green, only blue, and only red. And then the combination of all that, with, with the combination of all that, our brain actually tells us this is white light, because it has an equal amount of blue, green, and red. Okay, But in nature, it's actually even more complex. Um, white light is usually made up of red, orange, Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Now, if you see a rainbow, then you can see that all those um, rays are included in the sunlight. And thanks to the uh, raindrops um, acting as prisms, so to say, they split up the light into those different colors. Okay. Now, back to the previous topic, as for why this ball appears red. It's because it is only able to reflect red rays okay it absorbs green rays it absorbs blue rays and actually all the other rays as well only red it can only ref reflect red rays therefore if we look at it only red rays hit our eye 
and that means that we can see a red ball. Now, this is supposed to illustrate that. You can see the green rays are being absorbed, the blue ones as well, and only the red rays are being reflected you know, to all sides, and therefore we can perceive it as a red ball. Now, the reason why only uh, red rays are being reflected is because um, it kind of has like pigments, so to say, okay? And only those pigments that the red ball has can only reflect red rays, okay? Now, the specular highlight, the uh, specular highlight is partly... Um, partly um, exists because of the surface structure, okay? Because it's a very smooth surface and therefore it also reflects the other rays. It is not really dependent on pigments, so to say. Now, this might not be a very scientific explanation, but it works for our needs quite well. Now, that's essentially it for this first topic. So keep in mind, the diffuse pass is always has the color of the object while the specular pass can have the color of the object in case of metals and stuff, but usually is white quite often. Now, the second thing I want to take a look at is our skin, and I'd like to um, explain subsurface gathering according to our skin, or with the help of our skin. Now, once again, we just have this um, piece of skin. Let's just uh, name it that. And right now, you can see it's nothing spectacular, but if there's a light are shining on it, once again this white light, then all those light rays, they actually hit our skin. Now our skin is not completely opaque, okay? It actually lets in a little bit of light. What actually happens is those um, light rays, wrong one, they actually, they actually bounce around in, within our skin, okay? They hit something, a part of it gets absorbed, as always, and a part of it gets reflected and goes to another part of our skin and at some point they come back out, okay? They go in like... Into our skin uh, goes an equal amount of red rays, green rays and blue rays, okay? Or in case of sunlight, all those rays, but it's easier to explain only with these three types. But out also come all, all three types, but not... Uh, with the same amount, okay? So blue and green is obviously less than red because uh, if you ever um, held your hand in front of a light bulb or in front of the sun, you can see uh, like that it glows in a reddish color and that's because of the blood as well. For example, uh, our blood kind of absorbs green and blue colors or blue rays, but it doesn't absorb the red rays so well. That's why it reflects red rays much better and that is why um, the subsurface gathering looks kind of like this. It's very reddish, orangish, and not bluish or greenish. That would look rather sick. Um, so yeah, subsurface gathering is basically um, light of any color that uh, enters our skin, and then it some of the rays are being absorbed and some of them aren't. And if white light enters our skin, then it looks more or less um, reddish afterwards. If, for example, you'd have a completely plain blue light hitting our skin, then um, you'd probably also see a little bit of subsurface gathering, but not a lot because most of the other rays would be absorbed and only very little of the light would actually make it outside. But then, of course, you wouldn't see a red subsurface gathering effect because there's no red in the blue rays that hit it. Then you'd always only see a blue one, but as I said, very, very faint, probably. So that's essentially what subsurface gathering is all about. Now the next thing is a bit more complex actually, um, and that is transparency. So let's first of all take a look at how transparency really works. Um, transparency is basically when a material has the ability of letting light pass through. Okay, for example, um, the glass, that we use for windows and stuff, has the ability to let light pass through because um, the light rays are not really able to um, transfer its energy onto the atoms or onto the electrons that are within the glass, okay? And since they are unable to do that, they just pass right through. But that, in, case, in the case of glass, this doesn't apply to the visible light, okay? For example, you, you ultraviolet light, Rays that are very, very high frequency and very, very, um, very, very short um, wavelength um, 
they don't do not pass um, glass so well. Okay, there are uh, other phenomena that are have also that also have to be considered in case of um, transparency. So let's first of all take a look at this picture here. You can see this is supposed to be water. Okay, this is air, and this is a light source below the water. Now I drew it in, I painted it in black because it's easier to see, but it would obviously be, for example, white light or whatever. Now what happens? Um, this uh, light source emits light rays in all directions, okay? And those light rays that actually hit the surface of the water in an exactly right angle, uh, let me just see, in an exactly right angle, like this, they pass through in the exact same angle. Nothing changes. But as soon as they hit the surface in a certain angle, let's call it alpha, then they enter, they, they uh, exit in a, um, call it alpha 2, they exit in an angle alpha 2, which is greater than the angle alpha. Okay. And that's always the case if um, the light rays go from a uh, medium with uh, a, a higher IOR, uh, index of refraction, into a medium with a lower IOR. So that me just means the speed of light or the speed of the light rays within this medium, within water for example, is lower than the speed of light in the air. Okay, And the, phenom the phenomena is that when it actually um, passes this surface, this um, barrier, so to say, then it changes the angle. And one thing that's quite interesting is that if it goes from a, a denser uh, medium, so to say, to a uh, less dense medium, or just a medium with higher IOR to lower IOR, then you can see, because this angle is greater, at some point, which is the case over here, at some point, the angle that the light travels with after it hits the surface is exactly 90 degrees, okay? So this is exactly 90 degrees. So it actually travels along the surface, which is not really possible. So what actually happens, it's being reflected according to the laws we talked about earlier with the same angle, okay? And the same goes for all the rays that hit it after this point, okay? You can see they're all being uh, reflected completely. Same goes, of course, for the other side. So until here, until this point here, just around here, you can see they actually um, escape the water, so to say, although they are being uh, redirected, but after that they are actually being reflected back into uh, the medium itself. And that's called total reflection. Okay, now there's of course the other case, when you have a light source that's outside of the uh, medium with the higher IOR, and within the medium with the lower IOR. You can see, once again, if the rays hit the surface in a 90-degree a angle... Oh, come on! Then they, uh, then they go on uh, in the exact same direction without being man ma manipulated in any way. But as soon as they hit the surface um, at a different angle, let's call it alpha, then you can see... Oops they actually uh, travel further with a different angle within the other medium, okay? And in this case, it's the other way around. Remember previously, if this would be the uh, medium with the higher IOR and this lower IOR, then it should actually go into this direction, okay? They would be like split apart. But if it's like they're like being gathered, okay? So alpha 2 is smaller than alpha 1. Then you can see this is what happens. Now, um, let's take a look at this phenomena here. What happens if we are actually like floating underwater? This is actually the eye, those are like hairs around the eye and stuff like that and skin. <coughs> Sorry about that. And those are light sources. So what happens? This is what happens, this is quite weird. You can see, um, because of the way they are being uh, refracted when they hit the surface, we can actually see everything going on in the sky and above the surface of water within this small area, okay? Even if there would be like a light source over here. Um, where are we? A 
example, lighters like over here, for example, those lighters would like travel, for example, like this, and then they would hit our eye from over there, okay? After this point, and after this point, we cannot see anything going on above the surface. Instead, in that area, we can see all kinds of things um, going on below uh, the surface, okay? So this is actually, once again, this total reflection thing. You can see, that's actually not very well drawn, this red line should be after that, of course, because you can see this is already a, a ray that's being uh, completely reflected into our eye. So within this area here, we can see the sky, and outside of that area, we can see stuff in the water, like, for example, the, the floor, okay? And I just rendered something in cycles here with Blender, and it looks like this. And this actually illustrates it quite well. You can see within this area we can see the sky and outside this area we can see stuff within the water. We can no longer see the sky. That's because the angle, when we look at this point or at this point, the angle is great enough so that it's totally being reflected back into the water so we can actually see the seafloor and some kind of fish within the water, but we can, no, we can no longer see the sky. Okay. So, yeah. Now, what happens if we have an object that's transparent? For example, we have a transparent a transparent sphere. Okay. So let's take a look at that just next. Um, yeah. So this is our object. It's like um a ball of glass or something. And now we have this light source, which is kind of like behind um, the transparent object. And then we have the light rays, okay? So let's take a closer look at that. You can see once again, this light source, it sends out rays into all directions. Now, some of those light rays, they actually hit this sphere. Now you can see those red lines, and those are always um, lines, imaginary lines, that, are, that have a right angle to the surface of this ball, okay? Now you can see this light ray um, hits the surface and then it's being redirected because of the uh, change in the IOR of the different mediums and then they travel through this inner medium without being redirected at all until they hit this other um, interface, so to say, and then um, they are once again being redirected according to the same change in angle. It's also towards the right, towards the right because here it's from... Um, low IOR, high IOR, and then high IOR, low IOR. So uh, it's twice the same kind of bending, okay? So this is like a lens that actually gathers all the rays in the same spot, or in a, or just it brings them closer instead of the other way around, which would be if we were to talk about this kind of lens, then, oops, wrong one. Then the opposite would happen. You can see, once again, the light rays they actually hit this kind of lens and then they would be bent outward, so to say, okay? So instead of gathering the rays, they would be um, dispersed or just distributed or whatever. Just um, they would uh, actually travel apart, further apart, uh, the further they go. Okay, this is another kind of lens. And yeah, that's what essentially happens when you um, work with transparency of realistic objects, okay? Um, one thing that's important is that the amount of bending happening here and here um, depends on the index of refraction of this object, okay? So if you, for example, if you have water, then the IOR is 1.33, then you only have uh, a slight bending. If this would be diamond, then the uh, IOR would be 2.46 or something, and then they would be bent much, much more intensely, okay? That's one thing that's important to keep in mind. Now, water, for example, is 1.3, 1.33, something around that. Glass is 1.45 to 1.6, depending on the glass. Uh, diamond is 1. Point, oh, is diamond is 2.46 or something. And yeah. Also, one interesting thing is that uh, if we go back to our white light, um, where do we have it? Lamp white. Let's um, can we check that and uncheck that. And let's go back to our previous to the lens here this one. Now what happens right here, um, as you might know, 
diamonds and prisms and stuff like that, they actually split the colors apart like a rainbow. And the reason that happens is because different rays with different wavelength, they um, tend to be refracted in a slightly different way, okay? So even though this is glass, which has an IOR of like 1.333 or something, um, the IOR is not quite identical for all the, the ray types, okay? So blue rays are being refracted in a slightly different way um, than red rays. And then that's why they are actually being split apart. And that's why you can actually then distinct between the different um, ray length types as, you, as it happens when you uh, look at a rainbow, okay? If you want to know more, if you want to know more about rainbows, then you can Google it and you can find lots of uh, resources. Okay, now there's one last thing I'd like to take a look at, and that is actually how um, you can color light, so to say, which is actually not possible, as I said before. But let's say, for example, we have this case, which is this is supposed to be glass. It's just a blue plate of glass, glass that has a blue color. Okay. And we have, once again, a lamp above it, like this. Now, um, here we go. Now, if, for example, we, our eye would be over here, right? then this white light source would to us appear blue because this is a blue glass and it's in between the light source and our eye. Now, if this light, so, uh, if this light source appears to be blue and if all the light appears to be blue, then obviously all we have on the other side are blue rays, okay? We can only see blue rays because otherwise, if there be other rays than blue, then we would see another color, but we can only see blue rays. So once again, what happens here? Obviously, it's not possible to change the wavelength of those rays, okay? Once again, the reason why this glass appears to be blue and why it actually changes the color of the light passing it is because green rays, as well as red rays and orange, yellow, indigo, violet rays, they're actually being absorbed by, um, by the glass, okay? By its electrons, mainly. So then the electrons, they gain um, energy but it doesn't work for the blue rays because they have the wrong frequency and that's why they actually pass through and we can only see blue blue light. And that's why it appears to us as if the light passing it is being colored, although it's not true, just, it's just filtered, so to say, okay? So that's um, that. So once again, to summarize, we have, first of all, talked about why um, certain materials have the color they have. And that is because um, only rays with the color of the object, as we perceive it, only they can be reflected, all others are being absorbed, therefore only red rays in this case remain. Okay. Next thing we talked about was subsurface gathering what happens when you have um, a well basically a translucent material like for example wax or skin what happens is the right some of the light rays are actually being reflected of course as always but some of them they actually travel into the skin into the wax into whatever we're talking about and then they actually they are being refracted they jump around they bounce around at some point they exit and when they do Some of them have been absorbed, some of them haven't, but what's important is that the ratio between the different rays changes, so also the color changes, okay? Because if we have less green and less blue and more red compared to the others, then it appears more reddish than it would have been, than it would have appeared before. So that's kind of what happens with subsurface scattering. Then the next thing we talked about was uh, transparency. First of all, how does it work? What is total reflection uh, after a certain angle? It's just that the light no longer no longer exit the medium. And by the way, this effect is used in by nature and by um, and by the industry as well. Uh, for example, um, glass fiber cables they essentially work this way. They just have 
a long um, cable of, of glass essentially and whenever the light hits the outer uh, border of the glass, the outer um, surface of the glass, it's totally, it's being totally reflected and therefore um, you can actually guide light according to that cable to wherever you want without a lot of light being lost on the way, which is really, really cool. And next thing we talked about is ha what happens if you have a light source outside the water, then um, the rays are actually being bent this way. Then we talked about what happens if we have this kind of setup here with a lot of lots of light sources uh, outside the water, for example, and we are inside and you can see this like this round kind of spot where you can actually see the sky and everything around it is totally reflective. So you can actually see that the ground at the sea or wherever you were in or in a pool or whatever. Then we took a look at how lenses work, like um, gathering lenses and lenses actually um, the opposite. They actually um, distribute the light rays in a way. And finally, how what happens if um, rays travel through a colored medium, for example, water, uh, where they actually become um, blue in the end, like this, where actually the other the other parts of the light are just being filtered out, so only blue light can pass um, the plate of glass. So yeah, I, I think this tutorial was a little bit messy. I hope you were able to follow along. I hope you understood most of the things. Once again, we are not scientists, we are 3D artists, so you don't need to know everything here, but it's just important to have um, a, um, a rough understanding of all this, so it is easier for you to anticipate how things are supposed to look like, and it's also easier to see what looks fake, okay? For example, you have an image, you look at it and you think, something's wrong, but I'm not sure what it is. Maybe you can figure it out just by feeling, but maybe you also have to go through and at, at some point maybe you're like ah okay I know how this is supposed to be scientifically and it doesn't look this way so that must be the problem and for me that helped me a few times um, and yeah it's always great to know such things so thank you for watching I hope you enjoyed it I hope you learned something if you have any kind of comments or questions or whatever make sure you post them in the comments and yeah that's basically it for the theory to materials thank you for watching and see you soon. Bye.